Hey, I'm Charlie Craven. We're here in Charlie's Fly Box in Arvada, Colorado. We've got a ton of flies and a ton of terrestrials here, and I'm going to show you how I build my terrestrial box. This time of year during the summer months, terrestrial, you know, there's a lot more terrestrials around and they're a bigger bite. You know, fish uh, um, are used to seeing midges and mayflies and things like that sort of throughout the rest of the year. But during the summer when you start to get the terrestrial activity, um, it's a bigger bite. There's, there's just more variety, more food in the water. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for a fish to pass up a big bite. So, um, you know, summertime, and I always, you know, when I go out, I, I, uh, I tend to kind of start with the terrestrial during the summer because I can. Um, there's, there's plenty of time to fish little tiny stuff and, and hunt and search for the right fly and little tiny stuff on the water. Um, but during the summer, man, it's a lot more fun to throw something big and foamy. Um, so, you know, that, that's uh, uh, partly out of, I'd even say necessity because the fish are looking for this kind of stuff. Um, but I'd say even, even more so just out of greed because it's more fun to fish. Uh, you know, bigger, bigger fly that's easier to see, um, you know, bigger hook usually holds on to those bigger fish better too. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that and kind of why I use different sizes. Um, but the, uh, you know, during the summer, one of the, the, you know, kind of primary staples is hoppers. And there's a lot of different hopper patterns. Um, this is a thunder thighs hopper, and that's a pretty realistic hopper pattern. And one of the cool things about this fly um, is it's got, got this coarse poly yarn wing. Um, so it's a pretty buoyant fly. Most of the, the really realistic flies sit pretty low in the water. They're hard to see. Um, they can be, you know, great for a fish that uh, is being picky, kind of tucked up on a bank. But, uh, you know, fishing it as a, as a dry dropper rig or even just as a single dry, um, the flies that are harder to see just are not as enjoyable. Um, so that Thunder Thighs has got a super realistic silhouette from the bottom. It's got the kicker legs on it, um, but it's got that big wide profile wing on top of it. It makes it a lot easier to see. It's also got a little indicator on there. Um, so that's a super popular one. That's probably uh, one of the best hopper patterns out there these days. Um, you know, I'll come, I'm going to jump across here to my Charlie Boy hopper, and this is what I fish most of the time. And this is sort of my, my go-to dry dropper fly. Um, you know, it has been for years. I think this fly's been out for about 20 years now. Um, and again, you know, pretty realistic silhouette from the bottom, pretty quick, easy tie, um, but with a big deer hair wing on top of it. Um, a little bit more subtle, a little bit more uh, drab compared to the, to the thunder thighs. Um, you know, I, I've always said that uh, flies that have longevity are generally going to be pretty plain flies. Um, you know, a bar merger is a, an example I use all the time that flies older than I am and it still works as well today as it ever did. Um, and it's because it's plain. It doesn't have, uh, you know, there is a flashback version, but it's just a plain little drab fly. Um, same idea on this hopper. There's not a whole lot of sparkle or anything like that on it. Um, just something kind of plain and drab that doesn't, doesn't throw up any red flags. Um, a lot of these flies, most of these flies are foam. Um, not all of them are, but uh, most of them are foam, so that makes them just a little bit easier to fish so you don't, don't have quite so much maintenance kind of hanging, you know, messing with them, trying to get them to float. Um, but a Charlie Boy is another good one for even, even fishing as a single dry. You know, if I've got fish eating hoppers, um, a Charlie Boy is what I'll usually put on. If I'm kind of searching cover in water, I'll use something that's a little bit more, uh, uh, more generally imitative. Um, another one when you've got fish re really eating hoppers, you know, so being selective to hoppers is the parachute hopper. Um, this is an old fly. This fly's been around a long time. Um, really slender, skinny little fly, um, but with a big parachute wing on top. So it's easy to see. It always lands right side up. Um, this is a really good design. This is a fly, you know, and this is uh, something to be said for any of these old flies that are still around these days. Um, there's a reason for that. Those, those flies have, uh, you know, have worked. Flies that don't work don't stay around. Um, this fly's been around a long time and, you know, it doesn't look like much from the bottom, but that's what a hopper looks like. Um, that little indicator post on top is, that was a stroke of pure genius there. That fly um, has been around a long time. That's a great one to use just by itself. If you've got fish just eating hoppers, um, you know, tucked in tight along a bank, especially in flat water. Um, you know, if you're in riffles and pockets, a, a foam fly like this, a, like a Charlie Boy would probably be, be a better option, but on flat water, slick water stuff, a uh, parachute hopper would be a, an absolute go-to. Um, kind of moving through this box, one of my, you know, probably my new favorite you know, dry, summertime terrestrial pattern. Um, I'll get a big one here. Is a fat Angie or a big fat Angie? Um, and this is sort of my answer to a to a chubby Chernobyl. Um, foam bodied fly, double macrame wings on the big fat Angies. Um, big indicator on top. Really easy to see, but just a general buggy silhouette. It could be a 
uh, could be a big wasp, could be a big beetle, could be a hopper in the right colors, uh, could be a lot of, lot of different bugs. So I'm not, not uh, you know, painting myself into a corner with just one, one type of fly. Um, this is a great one for a dry dropper rig also. You know, when you're, when you're kind of covering water and just searching, um, a fly that will float and doesn't require a lot of maintenance, but will hang a drop, will hold up, hold up a dropper under it, um, something like that with a big profile. The Thunder Thighs is pretty good for that too. It's maybe not quite as buoyant as a Fat Angie, um, but the same kind of wing and same kind of profile, profile idea. Um, and you can see if you look at the bottom of that fly, how wide it is, that's what makes that fly float so well. It's not the, not the foam per se, but it's that wide profile, lots of surface area. Um, and I fish that, I'll fish that in a variety of different sizes, you know, down in the, in the smaller sizes, I typically fish these by themselves, um, just as a single dry. Um, you know, even when you don't have a lot of fish rising, when you cover water and you, and you know, I always say if you put the fly in the right place and fish it like there was a fish there, uh, most of the time there is. Um, you know, I, we just came back from Wyoming and fished these along the banks just with a good long drift and it, it was amazing how many fish, you know, come up and are looking for stuff like that. And they come in a bunch of different colors, um, you know, pretty easy fly to see. and. And really for me, you know, the, the beauty of it is, is it's not a fly that you have to maintain. It floats pretty good. You don't have to change it out constantly. Um, holds up really well. Um, you know, sometimes you'll get in, in situations where, where fish are, uh, especially with hoppers as the season goes on, and I see it, you know, about this time of year, you're kind of late August into September, um, fish have seen a lot of hoppers. So you'll get fish that'll come up and look at your hopper and not eat it. Um, and that's where I think, uh, you know, think about things that, that I call extraterrestrials, which um, are beetles and ants. Um, this Carl's foam flying ant, which really I think gets eaten as a beetle. It could be a big carpenter ant, um, but is a pretty low floating little, you know, it, it, it's a foam fly. So I always kind of, you know, from, from my day, I always kind of think of it as like a bluegill bug, but um, a pretty low floating, uh, subtle little kind of stealthy terrestrial pattern. Um, this is for those fish that are kind of, you know, tucked up in a pocket that are, uh, um, you know, they could even be eating something else um, and you throw a little beetle at them like that and they it's astonishing to me how often they come up and eat that. Um, fish know what beetles are. Um, I've had too many times, um, I'm going to dig one of these guys out, this is Lawson's foam beetle. Uh, too many times on these, uh, you know, pressured tailwaters we've got out here where I've just made the fish look like fools with a beetle. Um, you know, and you just walk along and, and look for fish and throw it to them like, uh, you know, like they were rising even though they're not. And it's, and it's astonishing how, uh, how often they come up and eat it. Um, and I like a big beetle. Um, I, I don't typically fish a little tiny beetle. I usually fish a pretty, pretty good size one, about a 12. Um, you know, fairly easy to see. They do sit low in the water, uh, but you're usually fishing them as a single fly by itself. Um, that's a really fun one. I don't leave home without those during the summer months. Um, little ants are another one. Um, and these are good, you know, the ants and the beetles both for uh, alpine lakes as well. Um, you know, if you had to have two dry flies on alpine lakes, I'd say an ant and a beetle would be a great choice. Um, it's, it's amazing how many of these, these critters find their way into lakes. Um, you see the fish cruising around the edges, um, and I very often will, you know, wade five steps out and then cast 50 feet down along the bank. So I'm only 10 feet out from the bank, um, but kind of intercept those cruising fish. Um, it's, it's surprising how often they'll come up. They're looking for ants. They're looking for things like this. This is what they're, what they're eating most of the time. Um, and again, this could be kind of a hatch breaker too. You've got a fish that's uh, rising, eating PMDs, or eating PMD spinners, and you throw an ant over there. He knows what it is. He'll, he'll, he'll participate. Um, and that, you know, it just makes it a little bit more fun because you outsmarted them too. You know, they were on something else. Andrew Grillis' hippie stomper. That's a great little, just sort of general attractor terrestrial. Um, and this kind of falls in the, in the realm, you know, it's kind of like a, like a, a humpy, which is one of my other favorite flies, um, but kind of a foam humpy. It's got a, uh, some rubber legs on it. It's dressed up with a little bit of flash on it um, and a uh, poly, poly wing, so it's easy to see and floats a little bit better. But um, this fly is a great searching fly. If you're just covering water, um, this, this fly is easy to see. It takes, makes a big footprint on the water. And what I mean by that is versus something like a little parachute Adams. Um, this will make a bigger footprint, so if the fish is looking up, he's got a better chance of seeing it, even if it's not right over his head. Um, and during the summer, there's enough of this kind of random terrestrial stuff flo floating down the stream that they're, they're looking for things like that. Um, the red one and the black one are, uh, are both favorites. Um, you can see that crossover for a beetle pretty easily. Um, I've done a lot of stuff with this fly. You can skate this fly. Um, he's got those long rubber legs on him. Um, that's a good skater fly, too. Um, I've used, I even used this fly during caddis hatches, and they it just acts right, they, you know, it's a bite for them. Uh, let's see, what have we not got to yet? So the original Morningwood stone was this little golden stone. Um, and I do carry this in my terrestrial box because it's still pretty hopper colored. It's kind of golden brown colored. Um, you know, not a lot of hoppers are yellow. Um, you know, not a lot of hoppers I see anyway. They're, they're very rarely yellow. They're kind of a cream or a tan color. 
Um, but, you know, we've got purple in here too. We've got, uh, you know, bright green chartreuse. And I see probably more green chartreuse colored hoppers than I do do anything around here. Um, the, the purple is sort of an attractor color. Um, and I think especially the two-tone bodies, and this is not just the morning wood, but a variety of flies. Andrew's uh, Hippie Stomper, the red and black, has got a two-tone body also. Um, just kind of doubles your odd of have, odds of having the right color. Um, but kind of mixing those colors up just so that you're not, um, A, throwing the same thing as maybe the boat in front of you or the guy that just walked by. Um, so being able to mix that up a little bit and, and, you know, different light conditions. I don't know that the fish see the purple as purple, um, but it's definitely something that sticks out a little bit to them. I, th I think there's just some curiosity in that as well. Um, this is another fly that's a fairly realistic fly. It's got a much sparser wing, still very wide, but a much sparser wing. So um, good for a dry, uh, dry dropper rig with a smaller dropper, um, you know, in these smaller sizes anyway. Um, but really a fun fly to fish just by itself. It's got those rubber legs, it's got the right silhouette, um, and it's not overdressed. You know, the, the big heavy stuff in flat water can be a bit much. You know, the, that's where you'll get a fish come up and poke it with his nose and not actually eat it. Um, flies like this are a little bit more convincing, you know, more, more realistic silhouette. Um, but the different colors, um, different colors and sizes, you know, I, I tend to scale down as the season goes on just because uh, even though the real hoppers do get bigger, the fish get a little bit wiser to them. So um, I tend to scale down. There's, it's, uh, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to go out there and, and throw a big giant hopper pattern. Um, and you'll get a couple days a year where that's, you can't go wrong with that. Um, and then those days are over and you're back to fishing something a little bit smaller. So I usually scale that kind of stuff down. Um, but that's a, that's a really fun fly to fish. That, uh, um, this is a, a fly that when those fish, you know, especially when you get a fish that comes up and has poked another fly, um, they usually will come up and poke this and then eat it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing you can do, a lot of times they'll poke your fly, uh, this is just a little fishing tip on that one, when, when they poke your fly, if they've been doing that, um, the thing to do is not set the hook. Um, that's what all of us do is they poke the fly and then you rip it out of the water thinking they ate it. Um, if you can wait until they actually eat it, um, a lot of times they'll poke the fly and then come up and eat it. They want to see if it's fake, um, especially on pressured water, um, or they want to see if it uh, uh, will kind of make a little circle. If you watch hoppers, um, here, I'm going to give you one of my super hopper secrets. Um, if you watch hoppers when they kick their way, when they're in the water, when they kick, they always kick themselves in a circle. Um, if you tie a hopper on with a loop knot, when they poke it, it turns. So that's my little hopper secret, loop knot. Uh, just a non-slip mono loop, then your fly will kind of pivot back and forth. And that's really the only dry fly I do that with. Um, but that, that's a little meadow stream trick that I've done for years.